In case you are not familiar with the Solutions Journalism Network, it's a network of journalists promoting a form of doing journalism that looks at how people are doing to solve problems. And I'm hosting this event in collaboration with LAM Portal as part of my lead project. But before starting, I would like to say many thanks to LAM Portal team, Laura, Lillian, Neil, and Romy for putting this event together in such a short time. Romy, if you want to say something. Thanks, Nieves. Um, yeah, I want to, to talk a little bit about our partnership with Nieves. Um, and hello, everybody. Again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. So um, I just wanted to say uh, that we have learned about solutions journalism actually through Nieves, uh, as she is also a researcher with Land Portal. Um, Nieves is conducting desk research and she writes about countries um, and she researches about the land governance context in different Spanish speaking countries. Uh, and it's through her that then she became also um, a ladder fellowship on solutions journalism. Uh, and she introduced us to this approach. So we saw a great opportunity here to better connect with environmental journalists, um, environmental journalists because of the, the focus of her project. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to better understand how to make information about land more accessible, more visible. Um, just for you uh, to know a little bit about Land Portal. So we are a nonprofit organization uh, established in 2014 with a mission to promote inclusive, democratic uh, access, open as well, um, access to land information. And we think that this is a very, uh, a very crucial, a key condition to allow decision makers, um, civil society, researchers, practitioners, particularly in the global south, to improve the way um, that land is governed around the world, from the community to the global level. And our work focuses on opening uh, data, uh, promoting open data, uh, on gathering and creating accessible knowledge, and on promoting debates about land rights. At the same time, we know that the issues about land are so closely uh, interrelated with environmental degradation, right? Because owning land or using land comes with the responsibility to also protect the environmental services that this land provides. So we, this is a little bit of a summary of why you now we are engaging in this partnership with Nieves. And we see that this is very complementary to both of us. I think on one hand, solutions journalism as the approach that Nieves is, is here champion, um, championing today, um, and Land Portal, both. We promote change through innovative ways and both share a commitment to thorough and accurate, high quality information that can transform the realities of people. So this partnership for us is really about enabling these two communities, journalists and the land community, to join forces and in shaping a more sustainable world. Um, but very importantly, by focusing on solutions. That is, at least for me, the way I see it is really by changing the perception uh, that environmental and land issues are part of a negative agenda and give room to a perception that challenges exist, of course, and we need to acknowledge them, but so should we acknowledge the solutions that these fields offer? Thanks, Nieves. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Romy. So the goal of my project is to facilitate training, dialogue, story production, and dissemination on solutions repairing environmental damage and improving land governance. And if you are interested in participating in this project, there is an open call for solution stories until March 31st. So please have a look at the webpage that we are going to put on the chat now, where you can find all the information about it. And besides producing a story, the participation in this project gives a lot of opportunities to keep learning about solutions, journalism, and to connect with other journalists. So um, check the web and, and reach out. My email is going to be there. Reach out if you have any question about it. So with this event today, we would like to contribute to an important conversation on how to report 
about the environment and land in a way that inspire us and empower us. And um, for that, we have a very special speakers that I will introduce to you in a minute. In the last years, environmental damage has become one of the main global concerns. And the media has played a very important role in increasing our awareness of the negative consequences on the environment that our economic model and our consumption habits are having. For example, the media has been informing on how the poles are melting because of um, global warming, how the life in the oceans is being polluted because of plastic, and how agriculture and life, livestock expansion is causing an unchecked deforestation in some parts of the world. In general, the stories that make it to the media are limited to describe problems. And when it comes to reporting about environment or climate change, actually, the headlines are quite dramatic and even sometimes apocalyptic. For example, in 2019, the New York Times said, had a headline saying, a climate change is accelerating, bringing world dangerously close to irreversible change. Or in 2021, The Guardian had another headline saying, major climate changes inevitable and irreversible. So those stories might raise awareness but they are kind of paralyzing as well. And when we read these headlines, it's very easy we can feel like how a, a, a small individual like me can do something to stop this irreversible and dangerous change. And many people shut down and get depressed. In fact, research done by the Reuters Institute shows that one, the main reason for people to avoid news is that news tend to upset them and depress them. Another thing about environmental reporting is that often is based on science, scientific research. This is important because it gives credibility. But on the other hand, it's difficult sometimes to connect with science for many people. And we miss uh, to get the story closer to the reality of people. The recognition of the power of information and journalism to create a vision of the world and our role in it inspires the question we want to address in this online event, which is how best to inform about the environment to mobilize the agency of the audience to deal effectively with problems and bring positive change. One of the ways is by framing the stories to look at the responses of people, of communities, societies to those problems and to connect them to, with real life matters, such as access to land. We know that human activities resulting in damaging, damaging the, the environment have important consequences to land access. For example, in the Amazon, illegal mining not only brings deforestation, but also brings the displacement of indigenous, indigenous communities from their land. So with this project, we want to find stories where solutions to environmental problems also involve improving land governance. But solutions-based journalism is not about positive news. It is about telling the whole story. And to talk about that, I'm very happy to introduce you to Alfredo Casares. Alfredo is a Spanish journalist and a founder of the Instituto de Periodismo Constructivo in Spain, an organization that works to develop training programs and consultancy on solutions journalism. Alfredo was a lead fellow last year. And for those of you who speak Spanish, he is the author of the book, La Hora del Periodismo Constructivo. And by the way, today is Alfredo's birthday. So happy birthday, Alfredo. And thank you for making the time to, to be with us in this special day. Our two next speakers are going to reflect on why and how to apply solution journalism to report on the environment and land. And they are going to show concrete examples. First, Svati Sanyal Tarafdar will address why solutions journalism works, especially for environmental and land reporting. And based on her own experience, she will talk about how to engage the audience through solutions journalism. Esvati is an independent journalist from India covering social justice and climate for international publications. She's also a lead fellow 
and her project is about creating a YouTube series aimed at young adults in India covering solutions on livelihood, health, and environment. After Svati, Mavi Konde will share with us a very concrete example on how a solution to repair the environment consisting of collecting seeds can improve farmers' land rights. Mavic Conde is a journalist from the Philippines, specialized on the environment, and also a lead fellow with a project to train and support agriculture reporters in Asia and the Pacific to report on community-based innovation in food systems. And stay tuned because at the end of her presentation, she has a very special announcement. At this point, you may be wondering, okay, but how do I find solution stories? One way to find them is to look in at data, to look for those positive deviants in data showing that they perform better than the rest. Lamp Porter is a fantastic source of data and information, and Romy Sato is going to share with us how we can use Lamp Portal resources to find and document our stories. Romy leads the development of Land Portal's country and thematic portfolios, as well as the creation of land-related publications and statistical data sets. And you had the opportunity to meet her already at the beginning of this event. So after each presentation, we will leave time for one or two questions for each speaker. And uh, at the end of the four presentations, we will have time for a general discussion. So please share your comments and ask your questions on the chat. So Alfredo, what is solution journalism? What does it mean to tell the whole story? And how did you get involved in this kind of journalism? Over to you, Alfredo. Thank you, Neves, and thank you all. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm the eldest of uh, four siblings, a uh, perfectionist, demanding, demanded as well, and very protective towards my brother and my sisters. And uh, as a young reporter, when I became a journalist, eager to champion journalism as a public service, I played the same role towards my community. I became an investigative reporter and editor focused on what was wrong, finding what someone wanted to hide and looking for whom to blame. That was what many journalists uh, we thought was major league journalism, the real journalism, the aspirational one, holding the powerful into account. And by then I was really interested in social initiatives that tried to solve problems, but I saw them as soft journalism features, sometimes even close to public relations pieces. Uh, I now must acknowledge I was wrong, but the truth is that for many years, I was struggling with that feeling. Uh, as Nieves said, uh, in a scenario of an excess of information, a lack of trust in the media and social polarization, uh, news avoidance is one of the consequences. People feel overwhelmed. They believe that we focus on conflict and drama too much. Uh, they think that solutions are underrepresented in the media and that we describe the world as a place worse than it really is. But people are demanding something else, something uh, really different. 64% uh, of the BBC viewers under 35 years old want the news to provide solutions to problems. And according to the Reuters Institute, young Europeans demand stories that, that can inspire them about the possibility of change, and specifically that provide a path to positive action. They need clues to, to participate in the society. So our responsibility as, as journalists is double-sided, as at least on, on one hand, uh, we, the media, help the people to make an image of the world. 
but we also help them to make an image of themselves in the world and the role they can play in society as active citizens or as passive spectators. Uh, the way we tell the problems and challenges is a key issue here. If we show them as great and unsolvable, people will think that I cannot do anything I will, and they will give a step back. But if we show and analyze the responses that our society is developing to solve these problems, to solve these challenges, and we share the learnings and the insights, maybe people feel inspired to take action and be really involved. So what's solution, Johnson? Nieves, you asked. Uh, first was the answer to my struggles. That's the first thing that I saw. And I understood that I could investigate solutions the same way I investigate problems with the same rigorous method and the same impact in my community. Solution journalism is rigorous, evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. That's what it is. And it's based on what Solution Journalist Network calls the four pillars. It covers a response to a problem and how it happened. It provides evidence of impact. It looks at effectiveness, not yet intentions. That's very important. It produces insights, learnings that, that can help others to respond to and points out any limitations of the response. There's no magic answers for the problems. So I'm sure uh, my colleagues will give later some examples about solution journalism applied on uh, environmental issues. But as Sir David Attenborough said during the last UN climate change conference, journalism can and must, I would say, give us hope based on facts and a path to collective action. If we need to mobilize, mobilize uh, uh, the society, we need to give them hope. And we have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. We just need to find them and use them and, and use science to do it as well. So for those who want to learn more, uh, I encourage you to attend the next free webinar that Solution Journalism Network is organizing for next week. Uh, you can do it on the webpage, Solution Journalism Network webpage, or using the code on the slide. So there you'll understand what Solution Journalism is, why it's important, why you should do it, and which is the effect on the, on the community that you serve. And also how to incorporate it to your daily basis journalism in a newsroom or outside a newsroom as a freelance. And if you need uh, inspiration, as Diego said before, or you want to check out good examples of solution journalism, you can access also the Story Tracker, that is a database with almost 13,000 solution journalism stories. You can find them also on the web page or using the code there. Uh, so let me finish uh, telling you what we're doing here in Spain. Uh, after some years developing uh, solution journalism projects, last year I wrote, as Nieve said, uh, a book, uh, La Hora del Periodismo Constructivo, The Time for Constructive Journalism. Um, and I founded the Institute for Constructive Journalism in, here in Spain. I received a lead fellowship from the Solution Journalist Network and I started to train journalists and students and advice media outlets that uh, wanted to include solution journalism in, in the uh, editorial strategy, strategies. And so far, we've trained more than 100 journalists here in Spain and 250 students. Uh, the media outlets we're consulting with are getting the stories on the story tracker, which is uh, a really an achievement for them. And one of them uh, have launched the first solution journalism section in a media outlet in Spain. Well, and finally, 
just let me share with you some of the main takeouts of uh, some journalists that uh, took our training workshops. Um, they believe uh, solution journalism systematizes something that they already do, but in a very intuitive way. So it gives you a method, which is very clarifying as well. They feel strong. They feel powerful. There are a lot of uh, freelance journalists interested in solution journalism, many of them. Uh, and they really feel empowered because they can make a difference as well in their, in their job. Uh, they also feel there is a very interesting point of view, changing the perspective, the way they look at the world, even the way they look at journalism. Uh, and also the, it connects many of many of the journalists feel very connected with the reason because they wanted to be journalists in the first place. So uh, they also believe it's not so difficult. Sometimes in the newsroom, it's not, it's not very easy to try to start solution journalism project. It takes time, it takes uh, resources, but as they say, we're just a step ahead of doing it. I mean, we can do it if we really uh, feel we, we have to. And they feel motivated, as I said, to keep trying to change things and to, to, to do, I mean, to make a better world uh, using journalism. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. I want to say, I, I want, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, one or two questions before moving to our next presentation with Svati. But I want to say hello to people joining us. I can see that there are people from Nigeria, Rwanda, Colombia, Brazil, Bangladesh. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And please uh, post your, your questions on the chat because we will have at the end um, a discussion and we would like to address all the questions that, that you have. So Alfredo, thank you for your presentation. One, one, of, one common question when we talk about solution journalism is that are we minimizing the problems when we focus the, the, the report or the, the news on the solution part? No, not, not at all. I mean, uh, as you said before, this is not uh, positive news or, or positive journalism or, uh, or good news. It's focusing on the problem, but under the perspective of the responses, under the perspective of, of the solutions, we usually cover the problem uh, from the problem point of view. And of course, we have to, you have to face the problems and the consequences, but also uh, you can look for these kind of responses. They can give us learnings, insights, and, and social knowledge as well. Uh, so no, it's not. I mean, you, you, you're you not minimizing anything. I mean, I, I would say, and, and Solution Journalism says, uh, you're doing the best, you're doing a better job because you are explaining more I mean, solution journalism helps you to explain the problems from other perspectives that helps people to understand them better. I would say that. Okay, so that's that's one a good reason to to apply this approach, and I'm sure Zvati now is going to expand our vision of why we should apply uh, apply this approach, and also uh, we I am very curious to know how how this approach in your part of the world, in India in particular, is, is received and how do you engage with the audience? Please, Svati, the floor is yours. Thank you. Greetings from India, everyone. And I'm so glad we all are here. So I'll start by sharing my presentation. So you can see. Yes, we can see it, it's Patty. Yeah. So I am an independent um, social justice and environmental justice journalist from India. And I, for the last 10 years, uh, a little more than 10 years, I live and work from Andhra Pradesh, which is a southeastern state of India. 
uh, we are very close to the coast on one side and uh, to the floodplains of two rivers which yield very fertile soil and um, almost three times crops every year and we have this innumerous factories in the state including uh, large thermal and fossil fuel using ones so i can tell you there is no dearth of pollution and climate and global warming related stories in here so um, as a as an independent journalist i prefer to go into uh, the remote villages and talk to people on the ground fishermen farmers people who are working uh, you know actually toiling and working and engaging with the natural resources uh, for my stories so in the last uh, uh, few years what we have been noticing is that the gap between the social justice part of it and the environmental justice part of their lives have been diminishing uh, sometimes it's getting very difficult to identify which is what because although we are living in the cities we are uh, kind of um, away from the real problems a lot of um, cushioning happens in our lives around us but those are the people who are mostly invisible less heard and very far away from our lives but those are the people they are interacting with the natural resources and they tell us they have been telling us for the last decade or more that their ancestral land and water have stopped supporting them so there we see a lot of climate migrations that are not recorded we see a lot of uh, health issues because um, the the groundwater is turning saline the soil quality uh, is changing the crops that used to uh, were used to produce in the past 100 years are not being produced in the same way anymore so things are changing the difference is that we are not recording uh, we were not recording a lot of those although the environmental uh, and climate change coverages have started going up uh, in the past 2 3 years because of the uh, the cop and uh, the doomsday news that are coming in from the scientists so uh, still it seems like the volume is not enough to reach our minds and hearts and i go back to this uh, article from jeffrey kluger in the times in uh, he wrote it in 2018 and he quite nicely accurately examined what is the reason and one of the scientists uh, uh, responded by saying that you know we are okay with imagining urgent problems but we cannot identify with climate change we don't know what it is what kind of shapes it takes and this is where i think we are talking about the middle income groups the middle class people as we say in india who are the maximum the major consumers of our news uh, productions be it in the te television or in the newspapers so um i am a lead fellow for sjn this year and my project involves developing a series of solution journalism stories for youtube and yes you heard that right youtube so um, in january uh, this year i ran an uh, online survey to ask my potential audience that why are you so disconnected from the news why are you not following the news and i came up with i, I don't think we didn't know all this but this is for the records now so they tell me very frankly that we don't watch news we don't watch tv uh, we don't read the newspaper we don't read magazines news magazines where are we placed in your news your information your coverage is not for us you get a you meaning us the media people the environmental journalists um the tribe here we cater not to the middle class people who can relate to uh the climate change or global warming and how that's affecting their immediate lives their businesses their livelihoods their cost of uh, living the quality of living they say that i am seeing a lot of coverage about people who are like you know the cream of the society and then the poor but why the fishermen are not getting the fish is not my problem my problem is if i am getting all right fish if that fish is okay for me to consume so that is the gap here that is one thing i uh, figured um we have to really communicate in some way with our 
primary audience. And we, as a, uh, as a media people, as uh, you know, experts in communication, we do so much of audience engagement and uh, surveys and analysis. This, I feel, has been a major disconnect. Um, so uh, when I was kind of trying to figure out how to reach my audience and how to make my audience care for the kind of stories I do, because I'm an independent journalist, I, uh, I could have chosen to do something else. I do it out of passion and I want people to bother, get bothered with what I'm writing and, you know, do something about it. So um, it's a funny anecdote here <laughs> that uh, in the beginning of my career as a journalist, uh, in a TV station for two months, I was kind of pushed into um, the lifestyle section. And before that, I had been covering crime, I had been doing human rights stories, and I had been doing politics, a little bit of it. And then to lifestyle, you, I mean, that has been the most painful uh, period of my <laughs> journalism career. Um, and I have started to appreciate the role of the lifestyle journalist. So when I was looking back, like, what do they do? How could they be so uh, strong and, you know, influence people really from their pages? Um, I came across this Taylor's and Francis uh, essay, which says that there are four dimensions in a lifestyle journalist's role. And that is to inform audiences, to motivate people, to provide a forum for the readers to share their concerns and to inspire and entertain. As journalists, we have always felt, we have always been told that, okay, you know, you should know your limits. There are boundaries. So if I follow this role, if I get so passionate about my environmental journalism and climate-related uh, coverage, and I start, you know, telling people, okay, you use this solution, or you use this, or you do this, where are my boundaries? Where are my ethics? Would I be wrong or right? Climate coverage is important, but it is also important that it is a science and I give out proper information, even when I'm talking of solutions that are working, right? So when I was going through this turmoil and this kind of, uh, uh, you know, thoughts within myself and trying to find a solution, I landed upon solutions journalism. And that was around 2017-18. And I thought, wow, that's it. That's it because solutions journalism tells me that you can do good stories, you can engage people, you can have characters, strong characters, you can resonate with your readers, and you can inspire all within your limits because it gives me pillars, four pillars to create my boundaries. So what kind of boundaries do we have in solutions journalism? They tell us the first one is response. Response to the problem that we are having. So the problems can be huge, the problems can be massive, but we can have smaller slices of those problems and people who are facing the kind of, this kind of problems from the ground, you know, have, and, you know, kind of oblivious we were oblivious to them. They have created their own kind of responses. So there is some somebody who has used eggshells to create filters uh, for water pollution, uh, for drinking waters. There are people who, a lot of people are doing a lot of things which we don't know. We are still disconnected from, as a journalist, from, our, from, from the sources of our news because those kind of responses are still in the, in, the, in the, you have to really go into the community for this kind of sources. So that's one thing, we have responses. Uh, and we have, we can find those responses, that's our first challenge. Then the second pillar is evidence. So it's unlike the lifestyle journalist uh, colleague of mine, I just don't stop at telling, okay, this is a nice product you can use and it can help you, um, you know, sort something out in your life. But we give evidence that see, this is working. And then the most important part of solution journalism is we talk of limitations and this is mandatory. We just don't talk about uh, the problem and the response and finish it off, which we usually do when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, positive journalism. We give limitations. Why? 
the solution is working or not working when it is not working and then from all of these we glean our insights so that people from other parts of the globe can replicate the solutions so that our government officials administrators policy makers can think of making this big and see if this can work on a large scale there are innumerable examples of such solution journalism stories everywhere and as alfredo said that anybody can look up solutions journalism tracker and there are over 13000 stories there to learn and find out so um i looked through my older stories before solution journalism stories and i found that the most maximum stories that had worked for which i had got uh, enormous reader feedback and engagement were this kind of stories where i had a solution a response to a problem and i had mentioned the evidence and how this can be this can work or not work so i won't go into the details of these but what i meant to say is solutions journalism is not entirely non intuitive it, it is heavily intuitive it is something we were supposed to do as journalists but we forgot on the way so we can bring it back we can bring our positive journalism solid with solutions but first by giving limitations and insights which is something one of my uh, mentors an eminent uh, broadcaster jun broadcast journalist told me last week that you know there are cases there are situations in fact most of the stories uh, the evidence and the insights might overlap the limitations and the data might overlap so what do you do you can allow one or two of the pillars to take center stage in your story and that is okay that is okay but when you do that focus on the limits and insights so this i wanted to say as a part of the how to and this is again the why of solutions journalism because this determines that our journalism is not just the fluff that many people assume solutions journalism it, uh, to be without uh, like if if i just go by guesswork it might seem that the solutions journalism is just talking of solutions it is not it is it is heavy work it takes time and effort and why you should do this you should do this because you want to add value to the journalism that you are doing you want to add quality to it and you want to uh, do something that you have always wanted to do as a journalist which is to affect administration and policy makers right so very quickly i come to the why uh, i told you my journey my uh, youtube project is kind of a uh, solution or kind of a you know deduction from these thought processes and uh, i will suggest any journalist any independent journalist or from the staff um, staffs in the newsrooms to try it out because it adds value to you and we have seen this the sjn has recorded data and researches that says that not only you feel good being a journalist when you are doing the solutions because your mental health is being taken care of we know that the, uh, so many journalists had to take a break during the pandemic because the news had turned so gory so mental health your well being is important and then we are able to inform our audience and inspire and engage them because we are telling stories from their perspectives we are telling stories that they can relate to we are telling stories that actually belong to them so if uh, like one of my stories that i'm currently working on is on restoration of water local water bodies so if anybody is interested they can see what people are doing local people are doing to restore these water bodies and they can try and think and implement the solutions in their own locality so that is what makes it so much valuable encourage audience to adopt sustainable changes with your stories and solutions so this certainly makes us uh, you know gives us the power to hold the government offices and policy makers accountable and it's good for the newsrooms it's good for um, the re uh, revenue side of it because it has been seen for one year some uh, uh, there the sgn had been running um, in collaboration some projects where newsrooms have been working as uh, solutions journalism and it has sh uh, shown 
that audience engagement has increased. People are more willing to subscribe to their newsletters and their programs and revenue has increased. So it's true, it's true. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Svati. We got a comment saying nice discourse from Dr. V. Janat. Janat. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing it properly. Uh, please engage with us in the conversation and ask uh, your questions in the chat. Thank you, Svati, very inspiring uh, presentation. And you have touched on many of the things that I wanted to, to address in the questions as well. Uh, for example, the accountability of uh, governments, because sometimes people, um, one of the reflections of some people regarding solution journalism is that maybe it's a way to distract the attention from the problem and that gets government out of the hook, right, in, in being accountable. But you are suggesting that it's the opposite. Yeah. Uh... I would have loved to go into details, you know, I, I would have loved to talk about this, but uh, what I'll tell, since uh, time is short, I'll just uh, tell that if we see a solution is working somewhere, then people from other regions with similar problems can go back and tell their administrators, uh, their um, policymakers, the government offices, that how are they able to solve those problems and why are we not solving those? The solution is there. And this has worked in many cases across Africa. Uh, we have a lot of stories, uh, um, solution journalism stories coming up from Africa in health sectors, um, in social justice, in environment. Um, anybody can just take a look at the uh, SJN tracker uh, to see those. This is possible. It, it's uh, Solutions journalism is um, kind of valuable, it adds that kind of value and quality to, to our journalism because it doesn't just tell us about the, you know, what is working, what is the response, or what is the problem. It goes into the, uh, you know, the evidence that it is working, the data that it is working, even if it is qualitative data, even if it is like uh, quotes from people, quotes of multitudes of people who are saying that, yes, this is working, and this is how we are doing it, and we are capturing limitations which is a major difference because when we capture limitations, we are able to understand at a higher level that, okay, in these situations, the solutions will not work. Are, are there ways we can surpass this solution, the, the, this uh, challenges and find or customize the solution? So in every way, it helps us look at solutions. It helps us customize solutions and it helps us, you know, for common people to come back and tell our uh, government officials that why are this why, why why are we not doing this so that's how we keep people accountable right yeah thank you thank you Svati so we are going to move on to our next speaker Mavi Kondi who tell us what what example do you have to share with us that connects repairing environment and improving land rights Thank you, Nieves, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. So uh, I'll be presenting about two complementing solutions, which are agroecology and land rights. So with what Nieves, Alfred, and Swati shared a while ago, there is indeed a need for us journalists to be proactive in looking for solution stories. And speaking of which, let me share my screen, please. Okay, so my presentation for today is about agroecology and land rights, two uh, solutions and two sides of the same coin. So what is agroecology? It is the management of farmlands like ecosystems in order to make uh, naturally beneficial interactions between organisms within an ecosystem possible. So for what ends? to boost crop yields without sacrificing the environment, human and animal health, and not certainly at the expense of these are poor smallholder farmers and farm workers, which make up the 
majority of food producers at the community levels. So in agroecology, the application of ecological principle is extended to food systems. You know, there are big organic farms that don't practice co-creation of knowledge among farmers, nor share land and resources for access to food production, or go for short distribution webs. So in other words, agroecology doesn't stop with organic practices. So food producers must also have the control in their food production and freedom to enhance the power of local markets together with consumers. So systems thinking approach is a big part of solutions journalism reporting. So as uh, Nubes and uh, Alfredo mentioned a while ago, it is important in telling the whole story. To do that, we have to understand the depth of the problem so we can tell whether the response the response is addressing the root cause or merely the symptoms of the problem. So according to a report by the UN level of ex experts on food security and nutrition, agroecology is one pathway for transforming our current food systems, which is the global industrial agriculture. So if you can see this, uh, 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 enumerate, enumerated items here, the two are very much in contrast. Uh, the current uh, system is large scale, high input, expert oriented, while agroecology is community based, food production, monoculture, diversified. So, so if you notice, we only have, we are only producing 20 food species out of thousands of edible edible plants out there. So it's also dependent on agrochemicals while agroecology aims to reduce that dependence. So it rely on a specific technology while agroecology is for interactions are managed among components so, and so on. So, so what problems that, that this uh, global industrial agriculture uh, bring to us. So one is there is surplus of food products yet hunger. We cannot address hu hunger. Even before the pandemic, uh, it remains a problem worldwide. There, there's also labor exploitation, especially in the global south. Cheap labor here for export products for land conflicts with ind indigenous peoples and worse they are killed especially here in the philippines it's, it's so dangerous to be an environmental defender so then it also they using agrochemicals uh, result in a chemical runoff soil nutrient degradation so so in this time of climate crisis so soil fertility or soil health is very much important in making or ensuring that our crops are will grow despite the amid the crisis so it also threatened biodiversity because uh, if you can also see uh, with our um, there is a monopoly of seed producers. They are only a handful and they are patented. So they, if we are going to continuously use this, we will, we will be uh, neglecting our range of biodiverse crops. So climate impacts and then neglect of local sustainable practices. So here are some responses, agroecological responses to the problem. Uh, the first one is about saving seeds by a local government supported community seed library. And the next one, urban poor community, is about urban community gardening as an extension of community kitchen. So it is a response during the pandemic. And the third one, it's about creating an alternative currency for a more inclusive local economy through cooperation. And the last one is 
about seed banking and on-farm testing and mass production for distribution and exchange. So what evidences of results uh, that these uh, examples produce or give us? So the first one, it reduced planting cost with access to locally adapted seeds, mm. meaning not dependent on agrochemicals. There was also mutual aid during the pandemic these seed savers were able to help those who, who found it difficult to access food in the city. And uh, when Typhoon hit them in 2018, and they were able to plant sooner because they have this community seed library. And for this next one, continued access to safe and healthy food during the pandemic and they were able to uh, learn knowledge on land and resource management, farming planning as well. And the third one, uh, it gives uh, those who were able to participate, even they are cashless, they're able to participate in uh, a thriving local economy. So it gives them a sense of belongingness. So it makes them happy. Although it was, it's already, uh, uh, it stopped this, this kind of operation, uh, it doesn't mean that it wasn't successful. So sometimes uh, solutions journalism stories are about this. It's not always successful, but it doesn't always mean that it's a failure also. So for the last one, crops can withstand salt water. So salt water intrusion is one of the main impacts of, cli uh, of climate change on farmers in the Philippines. So what are the limitations? Uh, agroecology is more laborious and there is also limited government support and there is corporate monopoly of seeds. So what insights can we get from these stories? So first is the application of ecological principles will vary in extent due to differences in territories. Another one is that it is anchored on improving integration with natural processes. And the most important one, all this ecological knowledge and skills are futile if farmers are constantly displaced. So, so it should be complemented with land rights. And Land Portal has a lot of information and data about this one that you can explore that, and use for uh, creating stories, complementing solution stories about agroecology and Land Portal. And okay, for the last one. So here we can see that that agroecology can help us achieve ecological balance, social equity, cultural vitality, and economic viability. So what's missing here is the SDG number 13, which is climate action. And if we uh, sum it up, it is the kind of climate action that is that all these scientific studies is asking from us. So in a way, it's also the kind of climate justice we deserve, don't you think? Okay, so, so I added some re uh, reading recommendations. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mavic. I, am, I have a question for you, but I'm, I'm realizing that we are running fast with time. So I might give the floor to Romy now, and then I will ask the question, uh, later in the in the general discussion, if that's okay. Sure. So Rami, over to you. What can what kind of resources we can find in Land Portal that can help us to to document our stories, to find stories? Thanks, uh, Mieves. I will share my screen with you um, quickly, and I'll ask one of my colleagues um, on Land Portal to um, share the URL, the link to Land Portal, so you can also navigate. Uh, for yourself. I hope that you can see this now. Yes, we can see it. Now. Yes, and I'll take you on a quick tour on Land Portal. 
Um, and I think this is particularly speaking to the pillar on evidence now that Alfredo also mentioned of solutions journalism. So this is really just to offer you uh, one place where you can find some evidence, uh, um, source of information for your stories. Uh, if you are focusing on environmental issues uh, and particularly linked with also land issues. Um, uh, land portal, as you see here, the first thing I wanted to highlight is actually that we have land portal in different languages as well. So it's four languages. Besides English, you also can have uh, an interface given in French, Portuguese and Spanish. Of course, most of the resources are still available mostly in English, uh, but we are, uh, this year particularly, we are making a big effort to also populate our sites in the other languages. Um, the, the way the land portal is structured is a lot of the information is cross interlinked to each other. And I think the easiest way for you to find resources, first of all, of course, you will do what many of us would probably do when navigating the internet using the search, but also to maybe get more accurate results to um, what you want to look for. Uh, there are ways that you can find these resources through a geographical focus, through countries, and also through specific issues. Um, I want to take you very quickly to the countries to, so you can see what you can get. So this is actually part of uh, an initiative that we have call, called Country Insights. And, and this is also where Nieves is working with us. And basically what we offer here is a brief on the land governance uh, context, the situation uh, on land governance in different countries in the world. So for example, you have here South Africa. Um, and if you click there, you have uh, an overview of the, where you can click here and have access to a more detailed profile of South Africa in its context on, on land. And these profiles have been written by researchers such as Nieves, um, and they also have been peer reviewed by specialists on, uh, on land in on those countries. Um, if I go back, you will also see here an entry point to find all kinds of related information to South Africa. So you have here some uh, socioeconomic indicators, um, data on these countries, but you also have news, you have related projects, development projects in South Africa on land. You also can find a whole collection of blogs, events, and publications, what we call our library resources. So this is a one way to find uh, um, evidence or information about land, uh, also about related to the environment on coming from a geographical perspective. The other way is you can find this through by navigating our different issues. So let me take you, for example, on indigenous communities. Um, and the same thing here, you have a structure where you can go and have a, a, a better insight into what it is about uh, indigenous and community land rights, what's important to know on this topic. Um, again, this is a, a brief that has been written by uh, an, an, a specialized agency uh, organization that works also on these topics. At the bottom, you will have the whole list of references. You also have some selected indicators data that relates to that topic. And again, if you go back, uh, you also have the whole collection of related news to this topic, blogs, discussions, events, library, and you can also find organizations working on these topics. This is okay, this is uh, these two ways. Um, and another part that I want to highlight is uh, what you can find under um, community and under library. Libraries is of course is our, you know, pool of publications. Um, the first thing if you arrive at the landing page, of course, you have an overview of the, the most the most updated, the, the most recent uploaded uh, resources. As you can see, we have over 66,000 uh, publications in land portal related to land. And of course, you can make a search. And I think that's very important. Um, that's how we would go. So for example, if you go and you make a search with land and environment, um, you get, over 15,000 resources here. And you can also make, of course, a filtered search 
uh, through these resources, you can filter by the language of this publication, you can filter by the geographical focus, publishers, you can filter as well through this type of issues, the same that I showed you earlier, uh, and in what's the thematic focus of each of these publications, and so on, uh, as well, of course, and very importantly, the type of resource, if you are looking for journal articles, if you are looking for legislations, regulations, etc. Finally, um, I want to take you to the community because this is also something that might help you on your research and in, in building your stories. Now, maybe you are looking for uh, people who can offer certain perspectives and stories. And here you have an entry point to organizations. And again, uh, you can also make a search here. Uh, we have over 2,400 publications. Again, you can make uh, uh, can filter it by the type of organizations and a few other filters. And you can also find people. Of course, because of privacy data, we are not displaying here the, the contact details of these people, but you can find at least sometimes the brief, some uh, brief summary of who are people who have subscribed to and created a profile land portal. For example, if we go to this person, you have a brief description um, that he's a student um, doing a bachelor's degree on environmental science technology. Um, and uh, I guess intuitively, you could probably find that person in social media. Mm. Um, and lastly, um, we also have a whole pool of uh, information about what projects exist on land and env slash environmental issues or, or anything that is cross-cutting with land issues. Um, these are development projects that takes place in different parts of the world. And again, here at the bottom, you can also make a search by um, the type of issue that the, the projects are focusing on, um, who is the funder of these projects, and so on. So I think this is really just a very quick tour to this resource. Um, do not hesitate to also sign up in a way to Land Portal if you want to get information uh, regularly through our newsletters. You can go here on Get Involved, and you can either create a profile um, so you can also have a profile which will be listed under the community. Um, and here you can also input your address, email address, and choose your languages to receive information from Land Portal. Thank you, Niedis. Thank you very much, Romy. Truly, the, the information collected in Land Portal is huge. I can, I can say that as a as, um, regular collaborator and user of Land Portal. And I believe that it's very helpful for us to, to know that there are all those resources there available. And it's true that it's not only about land, right? There are other cross themes uh, connected to land that can be of uh, great uh, help for the stories regarding environment. So let's... Um, I can see how the clock is moving fast. So let's let's uh, start our general discussion and address some of the questions that we got from the audience. Um, we have here a question from Pin Pravalprushkul. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it properly. It says, when it comes to addressing global environmental problems like mitigating climate change, there tends to be overemphasis on encouraging individual behavior change, like for example, reducing energy consumption, eating less meat, and less on the urgent need for higher level changes, like government policies and laws, businesses and industries. How can solutions journalism push for these larger systemic changes in addition to individual level changes? Who wants to address this question? Uh, actually, that's a, a major, major opportunity for solutions journalism because, as we always say, solutions journalism stories uh, delegitimizes excuses for inaction. So we always have to think of the systems thinking approach. So are we just responding to the symptoms of the problem or the root cause of the problem? So that's one way of really looking at it and uh, 
And we always emphasize that with solutions, uh, we really uh, make it uh, make a case for effective policies, effective action, effective responses that make those who do not, who don't, uh, who are not, who are not taking uh, the action, the needed action for this kind of crisis we are having. Do you want to add something to this, Svati or Alfredo? Yeah, I can. This is like one of my favorite points, <laughs> of course. Um, see, the main problem we have here is the disconnect with our audience. So uh, if anybody is uh, has been following the uh, Indian news in the last couple of years, we had the people actually proved that people protest works. When people get united and ask for something, the others on the other side have to listen. We had uh, the farmer protest going on for over two years. We had protests uh, regarding uh, the Citizenship Act that the present government was trying to um, bring into force. And everybody protested and they pestered. This is not happening when it comes to climate news. This is not happening when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, we think that it's the government's job. It's the scientists and they're always um, uh, telling, you know, gloomy stories. So it, it's not bothering us. We start bothering when we understand that there are things happening around us which we are not aware of, for which I'm having to pay 50% more electricity bill. Uh, things that are causing us, you know, bringing toxins into our body for which we are having certain kinds of illnesses. Once we start getting associated with this, and once people understand that global warming or climate change or environmental issues or toxicity in the soil and water are not far away things, this is close home, we should be bothered. Then they'll probably start demanding the change and then probably our leaders will not be able to, you know, just simply do business and run away from the scene. They'll have to be accountable. They'll have to do something about it. So what do you think, Alfredo? Yeah, I would very quickly uh, say that I would say that um, it's true that uh, focusing on individual behaviors uh, change is the easy way and that's true but we need we need everyone to be involved we need this to be a global movement which involves individuals as well but also organizations institutions uh, companies governments everyone so uh, if you put all the pressure on the individuals be individual behaviors that's not fair and it's not so we need to put the pressure on on, on higher level measures as, as the as the uh, person who asked the question says uh, and you can do uh, by denouncing what we're not doing that's okay but also we can do it pushing through making visible a lot of responses that uh, collectives communities organizations NGOs even companies are are trying to to uh, develop to to as, as a response to calamity. So you can push by making visible a lot of initiatives that are working and learn from them. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly add that I agree with Pin's point. I don't know whether it was evident from my answer, uh, but I agree with Pin's point. The onus is not on the individual because at this point, at the stage we are in, Individual behavior will not bring the kind of change that we need. But what I'm trying to say is that probably uh, through solutions journalism, we will be able to bring all the individuals on board for a collective protest. Uh, so yes, the systems have to work and we have to get our leaders to work on the systems. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Before moving to the next question, I would like to remind our friends joining us that if you are interested in participating in this project, have a look at the webpage on the project and there is um, 
there is an open call for solution stories until the March 20, 31st. So um, feel free and we are hoping that you send your pitch and, and see the opportunities that participating in this offer in this project offers also to learn more on solutions journalism and to connect more with journalists applying this approach. So let's move on to another concern which is um, we have a Josan Potel saying that environmental and land issues requires deep knowledge and understanding for journalists to report. Do, how can we reconcile the fact that maybe journalists, we don't have the time sometimes to get that knowledgeable about the, the topics that we, we are reporting. And also this reminds me, this, this uh, science-based reporting on environment, which sometimes there is also a concern about if these solutions uh, clashes a little bit with what scientists are saying of what the problems are. Do you have any reflection about that? How, how we can reconcile that? Any thoughts? Yeah, have it go. Um, can you repeat the uh, question, please? Yes. Well, sometimes, I mean, reporting about the environmental land requires knowledge and sometimes mm -hmm. specialized knowledge, right? And we, we don't always have the time, journalists, to, to get that knowledgeable about the, the topics of our stories. And also in the case of environment that so far, the, the, the reporting on environment has been very much based on what scientists say that what the problems are, global warming, etc. So how, by reporting on solutions, is there a barrier there in terms of uh, not having enough knowledge of what the problem that that solution is trying to address? Yeah, that's a valid concern, especially if you are not that into a particular environmental topic. So, but there are a lot of experts that you can talk to, you can fact check, you can vet what they are telling you by talking to a lot of, of experts, not only those that from the academe, but we also have this uh, people-led science that we can talk to and verify all these things, all this contrasting information we're getting and how we can reconcile them. So it also helps to talk to people who, who don't, don't have the interest in the topic. Uh, it's very important. They're like the, the middle person for the pro and against. You really have to look for those people, those that don't have the interest in the story you are uh, talking about or writing about. I'd, I'd like to quickly join uh, something, add something there with Mavik. I completely agree with Mavik that we should talk to the scientists, we should talk to more people, and we should all talk to the local people. Because as journalists, we are not supposed to uh, always analyze if what somebody is doing right or wrong, because our sources are kind of our trust, uh, trustees, right? And we have to trust them. So if a group of people tells us that, okay, this is working for us, then we have to listen to them and we have to report that. And probably we can have, uh, we can incorporate the scientists conversation as well, because that's why we have the three other pillars, right? Insights, limitations, and evidence. Uh, the evidence will tell us if the solution is working. And if it is not working, we will know from the data that we have. And we are able to collect that insight. Um, you know, uh, whether this is uh, one thing I'll just point out here. Uh, I think we didn't mention anywhere that solutions journalism just not only caters to the solutions that are working, the solutions that are failing in that sense, the solutions that are not exactly working. Those are also part of solution journalism because we are collecting insights, we are collecting evidence, we are learning that why what is not working and why is it not working. 
So again, uh, we have to trust the people that are telling, telling us that these are working for us. There are a lot of uh, information and wisdom with the indigenous people and we have to pay attention there. And of course, uh, we have to listen to the scientists and uh, like what, how they guide us. And regarding how uh, the requirement for deep knowledge and uh, it, this is something we have to kind of incorporate into the workflow that we have um, as journalists. Mm, yeah. May I add also that there yes. is this so-called transdisciplinary approach where uh, researchers are required to work with the people they are studying with so so that together they co-create knowledge so it's not it's not only the researcher who is uh, producing knowledge but they are required to co-create to define what the problem is and what the recommendations would be together okay thank you Thank you, very interesting insights. Um, we have a question here. Maybe Alfredo, you can address this one. Is solutions journalism the same as advocacy journalism? No, it's not. Uh, I mean, no, you, you don't, I mean, you don't underline or don't, you don't take sides on that. I mean, you just offer a response. You, report you investigate you analyze a response and if you follow the four pillars it's a method that drives you to a complete solutions approach and, and that's it i mean you it's it as swati said before it's not a matter of uh, heroes or heroines doing things and it's not it's not a matter that i write for um uh, taking the side with this story or this, or this approach or this response. There is a very interesting, uh, in, the, in the webinar I, I recommended before, um, you can learn what is solution journalism and what is not. And there is a very, very interesting chapter, which is what it's not. So in the what is not is not advocacy and explain really well why it's not. Um, so I would say very easy, the answer is no. To the question. Thank you, Alfredo. Here we have a reflection from Vijanath Ja. Highlighting an environmental issue is one thing, finding a solution to the issue is another. Honest journalists often suffer on this count, often at the cost of their lives. Such cases need to be highlighted to make the discourse more comprehensive. Do you have any reflection about this? Do you share this concern? I'm not sure here if there seems to be not a specific question, but more, more a reflection. Is it um, dangerous to report on solutions? It, it is, it is, no, it is, that is what I wanted to figure, uh, point out that um, when we, I mean, mostly in India, covering land access, covering um, rights to land, encroachment, deforestation, delistment of, uh, you know, forest lands, these are sensitive subjects and these are dangerous subjects. I have colleagues who, uh, you know, have had great trouble reporting on sand mining kind of uh, issues, but this is these are important um, parts of a journalist's work. We certainly have to uh, highlight problems. We have to investigate. We have to sometimes, in fact, most times, work as a watchdog when we say that okay, something somebody is stealing something, somebody is not doing things right. But when we do solutions journalism. We are looking at solutions. We are not uh, just shouting about the problems. We are giving solutions. And this immediately turns the, changes the energy of the story, if I should say that. It, it gives you solutions. It tells you how to address these problems, how a small community in a small region probably are addressing these problems. And these are learning points that we have. So we are not uh, putting anybody at risk there. Even people who are perpetrating uh, 
uh, any kind of uh, you know falsity in those regions they are probably not uh, scared when we say see the land encroachment happens and this is one way we can solve it so uh, restorative ju justice for example is one way a lot of people are finding solutions uh, to a lot of conflicts so if we highlight those solutions this is not dangerous for the journalist i i i hope thank you swati here i think there is one comment for you solutions journalism seems to prove deeper in showing evidence that something works i am keen i am keen to understand how the pillar on insights contributes to telling the story can you ex expand a little bit on that um yeah, I'll start. I'll start, but I hope Mavik and Alfredo also joins in because they have did they have done a lot of work in this area. So uh, insights help us because um, suppose one of our solutions are not working. People have found something that works, and when they scale the project out, it is not working the same way as it was working earlier. So those are my insights so if i start talking about like uh, there have been innumerable stories on um, how police atrocities in the us i remember immediately one story i i think i mentioned it once before like um, in mexico i think some people in a very small area were using eggshells to clean up the water clean up the drinking water there has been so much pollution the drinking water was contaminated. They were using eggshells. And we can immediately understand that this is like this can only fit in for a small uh, group of people in a small community because it's not uh, easy, it's not possible to get that amount of eggshells, you know, so that uh, the entire district or the entire region can eat. So those are my, uh, you know, insights. The, those tell us like what can we do uh, to probably surpass the obstacles. Thank you, Swati. Romy, did you raise your hand? Uh, it was very quickly to, to actually comment on the earlier um, comments posed by one of the participants. Um, I think in terms of the dangers now of reporting on solutions journalism, um, and I would also, also take this question to um, maybe a, a fear or danger in, in terms of reporting on land issues in general. And I think as Swati was saying, uh, I think it's not dangerous per se in reporting about the solutions, but of course, uh, in itself, but of course, when you're doing solutions journalism, from what I understand, you have to be very thorough, um, comprehensive. It's not just about the positive side. So uh, I think in general, of course, reporting on land issues can be dangerous for certain people involved, of course. Um, this is also something that we take very carefully in Land Portal. Um, and we, I mean, we are an organization that advocate for open data. But of course, and there is a lot of confusion about open data and being open about private data. And that's not the same. You know, and just wanted to reinforce that. And I think anyways, uh, the work of a journalist is also to be very careful with um, his, her sources. You know? So I think this is always at the bottom line when you are conducting, uh, when you are making, building your story. And I think to help also with this uh, and, and get better insights now with, relating to the earlier question um, is this is why we need to be um, very careful in where you do your research. So if you find sources if, uh, that um, websites, uh, pro data providers, they offer you a whole spectrum of perspectives. I think that's very important as well. Thanks. Definitely. Thank you, Romy, for that. Uh, we are having, we, we have five minutes left, and I would like to remind everybody of the open call for pitches on solutions repairing environmental damage, but with, with a positive impact on land access and rights as well. And something important is that the pitches should be in English, but the stories can be written in any language because translation will be provided. Uh, the idea is to publish the stories in local media and to disseminate, it, disseminate them globally through LAM portal. Uh, so if you have any question, 
uh, please reach out. Uh, I will be happy to answer any question that you may have. And there will be, as I said, not only the opportunity to develop a story, but also to get more training and more um, networking on solutions journalism. And now I would like to, to let Mavic tell us, because I think Mavic is uh, also having a great uh, um, training prepare, I think, for her own project. Can you tell us a little bit more, Mavic? Thank you, Nervous. Yes, we are collaborating for our lead uh, projects. And mine is about uh, producing uh, agroecology stories in Asia. So if you're interested, we are providing climate reporting training with Climate Tracker and Solutions Journalism 101 with a uh, former lead fellow and then online consultations with me all throughout the story production. So if you're interested, please pitch us a story about agroecology and land rights. And the call for pitches is now live in the website of climatetracker.org. Thank you, Mavic. And we got a last question. I think uh, we have three minutes. Uh, let's try to address it. Much, been, uh, much has been spoken about the potentiality of solution journalism in places like Brazil, Mexico, and India. The same places where land rights and environmental protection are generally understood in opposition to big corporations and big farmers' financial interests. Land conflicts and life threats to human rights defenders and journalists are often seen. What are the steps you guys take to protect your sources and yourselves? Another one on, on protection and safety in doing journalism. Yeah, that's a very fair question. Uh, and I will, let, I will let someone who's uh, doing the, this kind of, of stories uh, on the ground uh, to take the floor and, and try to give uh, an answer how yourself uh, are doing that? Um, in my experience, it pays to coordinate with, yes, people on the ground, with longtime campaigners, coordinate with them, tell your plan and look for someone you can trust from the local area. Don't go there as uh, some as without, without coordination, it's very important. Okay, thank you. So we have one minute left to, to say thank you to, to all of you, to Romy, Svati, Alfredo, and Mavic. And thank you for, to everybody who has joined us and, and those who are going to listen to the recording as well. Uh, we are very happy and pleased of having this conversation about a topic that we consider that is important. And we try to, to somehow create a positive uh, impact in, in the way we do journalism. And in this case, regarding the environment and land. So please check the web page, uh, send us uh, a pitch and uh, you will have opportunities to, to work with us and to learn more how to do solution journalism. And thanks again, have a good uh, night, evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>